forgetfulness on a high level, failing to recognize your father, mother, spouse, or child, because the brain has undergone few changes. The brain is unable to recollect anything. Dementia and Alzheimer's are on the rise. Symptoms? How can it be treated? We have Sister Hannah Morris with us here today to speak about this topic. Sister Hannah is a revert to Islam of 10 years, a mother of four, and currently working as counselor and lecturer in psychology for the IOU. She has a master's in health psychology and psychological sciences, has experience working in the field of health and social care in UK, USA, and Ireland. Without taking more of your time, I present to you Sister Hannah Morris. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as salam, Sister. Audhu billahi min ash shaitan rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Sayyidi al Mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. For that very kind introduction, um, like the sister introduced me, I'm going to be presenting on dementia today. So in today's session, inshallah, we'll begin by looking at the facts about dementia, the causes of dementia, the risk factors, the types, the symptoms, the diagnosis and the treatment. And then we'll be specifically looking at Alzheimer's disease, going through the different stages that the person with Alzheimer's disease will pass through the Islamic perspective on dementia and Alzheimer's disease in terms of how we look after somebody with Alzheimer's disease or dementia uh, and how we treat the person and how we see it actually um, in the Quran even. And then how we can care for the person with Alzheimer's and dementia and also not forgetting about caring for the people who care for people with dementia as well. And then we'll just finish um, on highlighting some of the current research in the field. So dementia is not a specific disease itself, but it is just an overall term that describes a wide, a wide range of symptoms that we will be looking at throughout this presentation, inshallah. But it's associated with a decline in memory or as, um, that is severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. It's associated with damage to the brain, um, specific or uh, the physiological changes in the brain, which we will also talk about inshallah as we go through, but generally it refers to a loss of cognitive function, including things such as thinking, remembering, and reasoning. And uh, we'll be talking specifically about Alzheimer's uh, inshallah in more depth. Um, so we'll be going into more detail of um, these types of symptoms and how these symptoms are progressed through. So in terms of causes of dementia, um, scientists um, don't yet know or fully understand exactly what it is that causes dementia. Um, but there have been some things that have been found to be characteristic to people who have dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, first of all, there's a notice, uh, we notice physiological changes in the brain, typically a buildup of protein. Um, is related to plaques and tangles. So plaques are deposits of protein that build up in the spaces between the nerve cells, whereas tangles are the twisted fibers of another type of protein. So it seems that the, the physiological changes that occur in the brain are due to um, something to do with protein in the brain, but they're still not entirely sure um, exactly uh, what the exact cause is. And it is true that um, most people, all of us, as we um, get older, will develop some kinds of plaques and tangles within the brain. But those who have dementia and Alzheimer's tend to develop more of these plaques and tangles that are develop in the brain um, with aging. And they also seem in people with dementia and Alzheimer's to develop in this predictable pattern, beginning in the area of the brain that's important for memory before it spreads on to other regions. As I mentioned in the previous slide, and we'll talk about um, in uh, later slides as well, the first symptoms really of 
dementia would be uh, with memory and learning. So this is something that is characteristic in people with dementia is that the plaques and tangles seem to develop in this region that's responsible for memory and learning. And this, this uh, results in some kind of loss of connection between the nerve cells, which is what causes um, these problems with memory and functioning. It's also been found that in certain types of um, dementia specifically, that there are um, like maybe due to stroke or blood vessel damage. This can also be linked with dementia and Alzheimer's as well. There's also the possibility that there's a genetic factor to it as well. There seems to be um, higher chances of developing dementia and Alzheimer's if a family member has also had dementia and Alzheimer's. And there's also the importance of other factors such as, as um, health and environment and lifestyle factors as well, which is also thought to have some kind of impact on the development of um, dementia or Alzheimer's. Typically, for example, maybe um, a poor diet or poor um, exercise, this kind of thing can lead to things such as stroke, which can ultimately potentially lead on to things like dementia and Alzheimer's. There are a few different risk factors, however, that we can take into account. Um, people who have an increased risk of going on to develop um, dementia or Alzheimer's. Well, first of all, age. Um, typically, um, typically, dementia or Alzheimer's are diagnosed at beyond the age of 65. So as the person reaches this age, the risk of getting dementia or Alzheimer's significantly increases. Although that's not to say that it doesn't happen in people who are younger, because it does. Um, percent of cases, um, it can the onset can be as early as ages 30 to 60, but typically um, it occurs in older age. Risk factor, um, like I mentioned, was damage to blood vessels that deprive the brain, deprives the brain, that's supposed to be, sorry, of um, vital nutrition. Um, which could contribute then maybe to the problems with the protein in the brain and the transmission of messages in the brain leading to dementia or Alzheimer's. So uh, physical exercise and diet as well can also impact on brain health, um, which obviously uh, we can make the link then between poor exercise and poor diet and poor brain health and ultimately maybe leading on to things like dementia and Alzheimer's. So there are a number of types of dementia. Um, there's Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common, um, the common type, most common type of dementia, and this accounts for about 60 to 80 percent of dementia cases. So really, is um, common type of dementia. There is vascular dementia, which is the second most common type of dementia, and this occurs when the blood supply to the brain is damaged. Um, and there's two main types or causes of this type of dementia. Um, one either being caused by a stroke or secondly being caused by small vessel disease, or this is called uh, multi-infarct dementia. Dementia is dementia with Lewy bodies, which um, really is one that has is dementia but it has the inclusion of the physical symptoms which are quite similar to parkinson's disease and that's what um that's what sets this type of dementia aside from the other um types of dementia and there's also frontal frontotemporal which is the most rare type of dementia but is associated more with personality and behavior and language change also some illnesses as well that can cause symptoms of dementia that are reversible. Um, any of the other types of dementia, uh, dementia that I've um, mentioned here are irreversible, but there are also some illnesses that causes the symptoms of dementia. And when we talk about um, treatments of and diagnosis of dementia um, towards the end, you'll see um, that this is how we kind of determine if someone has actual uh, dementia is to um, rule out these things first, other um, can cause symptoms of dementia. So to refer specifically to Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease is progressive, it will continue to get worse and like I said it's the most common type of dementia. 
typical symptoms would be uh, cognitive and behavioral changes. Um, so it can affect things like thinking, remembering and reasons as well. And then this can affect behavioral abilities as well to such an extent that it can interfere with the person's daily life and activities. And this is what really leads to diagnosis is when it gets to the point that you notice that it's interfering with the person's daily life. It's also, again, like I mentioned before, probably likely to due to this uh, buildup of protein on parts of the brain structure. Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging. Obviously, you know, as we get older, there is um, decline and we do see changes in behavior but in Alzheimer's and dementia the changes that we see um, go beyond what would we would normally expect to see uh, as part of aging uh, like I said it's progressive so it is something that will um, continue to get worse common early symptom of Alzheimer's being the difficulty remembering newly learned information because like I said, the changes typically occur in this part of, part of the brain that affects learning. And it might be actually that people who have memory loss to the extent that it is a possible diagnosis of Alzheimer's don't actually recognize that they have a problem at first. Actually, it would be um, the family and friends that would be recognizing the differences in the person who is developing Alzheimer's or dementia. There are several, several different stages that people with Alzheimer's progress through. Um, sometimes it's categorized into three different stages. Um, today I'm going to talk about seven different stages. It kind of helps to break it down um, even further again. So in the first stage, you would um, just see normal outward behavior because actually the changes at this point are taking place with inside the brain um, so we see all these physiological changes going on in the brain but at that time the, the behavior the, the changes are not seen outwardly the only way really to see that the person might have Alzheimer's disease at this point would be um, through some kind of imaging test um, which obviously if they're not um, showing any symptoms then they won't be undergoing any of these types of tests so at this phase we see normal behavior on uh, on the outside you wouldn't know that there is a problem in stage two you might see some uh, very mild changes at this point and even uh, friends and family at this point probably don't even see differences really um, certainly a doctor who doesn't see them every day certainly wouldn't be noticing any differences in the person um, at th this point. Mild things such as, you know, forgetting a word or misplacing objects. But, you know, this is something I think that all of us do at some point um, anyway, but not something that you're not at a stage um, here where there'd be any cause for concern. Whereas by stage three, this is the point where somebody, people from the outside, fam family and friends, might start noticing changes in thinking and reasoning. So it might be that um, they forget something that they've just read, or they might ask the same question over and over again. They might have more trouble making plans or have difficulty remembering names when meeting and I know these are the kinds of symptoms maybe that we all have at some point, but for people who are close to them, um, they would notice that this is happening perhaps more regularly than normal, regularly um, than you might expect of somebody who is of that age. By stage four, we see a moderate decline period that the problems in thinking and reasoning that were noticed in the previous stage become a lot more obvious and not only did they become more obvious perhaps it's happening more regularly now it wasn't just a one-off that they've forgotten a name they're forgetting names all the time by this point but you might see now the the appearance of new issues as well and they begin to forget information about themselves trouble um, remembering what the date is um, they might forget what month or season it is. So things become a lot more obvious at this point. 
in stage five, this is where what we would call moderately severe decline. This is where things really begin to get a lot worse, where the um, person might have be losing track of time and place at this point. So it can get really quite uh, worrying for the family at this point because they might be have, having trouble remembering their own address, their own phone number, things in their history, where they went to school, where they've lived before. They might even get confused with um, what kind of clothes to wear for the day or season. And this is how you know that things are really not okay anymore. Uh, it might be that it's, you know, um, it's freezing cold outside, but they want to wear something light um, because they're unaware of the seasons at this time. In stage six, this is where we see severe decline, where the person who has Alzheimer's disease would be maybe mistaking one person for another. It might be that they're experiencing some kind of delusions as well. Maybe they, they're thinking that they need to go to work even though they don't have a job anymore. Um, typically, you might see within the family where the person mistakes his wife for his mom. So at this point, we see quite severe cognitive decline. And in the final stage, stage seven, is where we see very severe decline. So many of the basic abilities in a person with Alzheimer's, so things like eating and walking and sitting, this is where these uh, basic things that we do um, de decline here. So this is where the person might need uh, assistance with feeding. Um, you might have to feed them using a spoon, making sure that they drink point um they're not able to tell anymore whether they're thirsty so they need a lot of help um, and assistance from the people around them at this point but really um what as i've discussed the stages there you've kind of seen the kinds of symptoms that are present in somebody with alzheimer's typically the cognitive impairment so um when i was going through the different stages there you'll notice that a lot of the problems were really to do with memory and communication and language and this ability to focus and pay attention and then there's also the non-memory aspects such as uh, word finding or visual and spatial issues and impaired reasoning and judgment as well and as we move towards the later stages and the more severe stages of Alzheimer's there are problems with confusion of time and place and this entire disorientation Amongst this, as we um, head towards the uh, um, later stages of the disease, we see mood and behavior changes as well. So they might be unpredictable in their behavior, become unpredictably aggressive maybe at times. And there are a number of reasons why this might be. Maybe it's because they realize, you know, what's going on. And it can be very frustrating when you can't remember these things anymore, when you're mistaking someone for somebody else. Um, obviously inevitably this is going to lead to some kind of behavior change because it's not easy to manage and adjust to this kind of thing so how does how do we diagnose somebody with alzheimer's well there's not actually any specific test to diagnose it um so when the it kind of usually begins like i said the the person who has alzheimer's or dementia doesn't necessarily realize at first that they have any kind of problem it's the people around them, their friends and family, that um, notice changes uh, in the person. Um, so uh, it might be that the doctor will ask the, the person as well as the family member or the friend as well questions about their overall health as well as their past medical problems and their ability to carry out daily activities as well as looking at changes in behavior and personality as well. The doctor might administer tests related to memory and problem solving and attention language and, and this kind of thing as well to maybe highlight any typical symptoms that are apparent in people with Alzheimer's. And alongside this, um, the doctor would carry out just the standard medical tests such as blood and urine tests and perhaps various types of scans, CT scans, MRI scans, PET scans, all these different scans actually rule out other causes like I said um, there are various other things as well that can cause similar symptoms to dementia such as um, medication side effects or 
um, problems with the thyroid. Um, and this is causing symptoms of dementia. So for the, the doctor also needs to look at these other factors as well to ensure that actually the symptoms they're having are not because of something else. So if they can rule out all these other things as well, so they're having the symptoms of dementia, but it's not caused by something else, then it makes it a lot easier to diagnose a particular test. It's not like you can just do um, a blood test that this person has Alzheimer's. Now, from an Islamic perspective, actually, if we look into the Quran, we can see that certainly, to some extent, Alzheimer's, the symptoms of Alzheimer's are actually mentioned to us. So, um, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah 16, Ayat 70, it is Allah who creates you and takes your souls at death. And of you, there are some who are sent back to a feeble age so that they know nothing after much, for Allah is all-knowing, all-powerful. So if you think about what I've just said about Alzheimer's, this really is a, a very excellent description of what dementia is, of what Alzheimer's is, because we see this cognitive decline um, in the old age. Um, so we almost see uh, people going back in age, like it describes in the Quran. And actually, the word alval is used um, in this ayat to describe this irreversible uh, weakness of the senses. So the specific word that's even used describes what it is to have dementia and Alzheimer's in that it's an, it is irreversible, it's progressive and it's irreversible. So it really does um, pay good reference to what we see uh, in dementia as well. And we also see um, that there are further verses as well that mention the decline in cognitive ability, dementia, as we see in the Quran in Surah 36, Ayat 68. If we grant long life to any, we cause him to be reversed in nature. Will they not then understand? Again, like the first example there, a really good example of how actually the symptoms of Alzheimer's and dementia are actually mentioned in the Quran. And we can draw from the hadith actually in um, ourselves learning from, from this, what's in the Quran and what we know exists today. And that is um, what was mentioned uh, and is reported in Tirmidhi. Take advantage of five conditions, youth before old health before illness, prosperity before poverty, free time be before coming occupied and life before death so we can um we can use the example of dementia this particular hadith to make sure that we take advantage of not only our good health before becoming ill before potentially developing dementia in older age but also when we're when we're youthful when we're young and we are physically able and mentally able to do everything that we can, that we should take advantage of this before experience the kind of cognitive decline that people with dementia do. Islamic perspective as well, um, Islamically, we can see recommended to us many of the uh, different ways to prevent dementia even occurring. So, um, Frequently, we are told about um, the use of honey and black seed because they are very good memory boosters. Um, obviously, in dementia and Alzheimer's, we see people having problems with their memory. So the use of honey and black seed to uh, boost the memory can to um, either delay the onset of dementia or even prevent it altogether. Like it said in, hadith, in, in a hadith, um, Abu Hurairah narrated that he heard the Prophet Muhammad saying, in black seed there is healing for every deed except the death. And this was reported in Ibn Majah. So um, really just uh, showing us the importance of things like black seed for um, of every disease. So obviously a good preventative measure for preventing um, the potential for dementia. 
And also, um, we are advised in the Hadith as well about um, making supplication to seek refuge from the things that occur uh, with dementia, the symptoms of dementia, or even developing dementia. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from miserliness and slothfulness, and I seek refuge in you from cowardice, and I seek refuge in you from being brought back from senile, geriatric old age, and I seek refuge in you from the affliction of the world and from the punishment and the hera in the hereafter. This here as well is specifically referring to that, making a supplication to Allah to seek refuge from being brought back to uh, being brought back from ger ger geriatric old age uh, and the cognitive decline that comes with dementia. So we're encouraged to make supplication to Allah to prevent this from happening to us. Um, furthermore as well, there's uh, the diet, uh, having a good diet and engaging in exercise as well, also as preventative measures for getting dementia as well. So we have, uh, there's plenty of things that we can make sure that we are engaged in to um, protect us from getting dementia. In terms of treatment for um, Alzheimer's, cure for Alzheimer's, uh, but there is treatment for that can either kind of slow or stop the progression. Um, and there are also uh, medications available as well that can uh, maybe temporarily improve, improve the symptoms, certain symptoms. Be that they're prescribed uh, medication that can help to relieve certain behavioral symptoms. It might be, um, it's common for people with dementia and Alzheimer's to get depressed. So it's possible for medications to be prescribed for um, depression um, to help to regulate the neurotransmitters um, in the brain, medication that can also regulate these neurotransmitters to assist with thinking and memory and communication skills as well. So there are medications to assist people with um, Alzheimer's, but they're not to cure Alzheimer's. And there's also things like um, cognitive training to kind of help to improve cognitive function. And it might also be um, that there are certain physical changes or things in the environment that are um, the response, the maybe aggressive response uh, if they have. So it might be that they need medication to control these physical symptoms um, that might be um, causing their behavioral changes as well. You know, it might just be that they're in pain somewhere but not able to communicate that they're in pain. So by treating the pain, um, you'll be treating the behavior as well as a response. There is a lot of um, research going on at the moment um, to uh, try and assist in preventing uh, the onset of dementia or um, managing, managing the symptoms once the person is diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's. Once the person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, there are a number of people um, that are involved in their care. So aside from the friends and family, there are also um, medics that can be involved in their care to assist with certain aspects. So um, the key person when person in diagnosing the dementia to begin with, the first port of call would be the general practitioner who will go through the various checks and refer them to the necessary people to um, to rule out any other potential conditions and also will refer on to various other people as well according to the person's need. The public health nurse is involved with uh, maybe going out to the person's home to help manage the condition, to work with the family maybe to advise them on um, how to manage certain behaviours or to manage the decline uh, in the dementia. The geriatrician is the doctor who specialises in medicine for older people. Um, so, the, so they would be very uh, with people uh, familiar in working with them. It might be that they see a psychiatrist, um, um, certainly a psychiatrist or, who is familiar of work, with working with people who are older in age and um, would be more familiar uh, with the symptoms 
that typically affect the personality and the behavior as well and can help work with them to develop strategies to cope with the diagnosis as well. Neurologist is rises in conditions which affect the brain. Um, so this is where the neurologist, the, the neurologist comes in. Now, obviously, um, as well as the changes that the person with dementia is going through and perhaps the frustration um, that they're facing um, with decline, we also have to think of the people who are caring for the person with dementia. And I think we should begin here by referring back to the Quran again as well um, in terms of how we should be supporting people with dementia. So in the Quran, in Surah 17, Ayats 23 to 24, Allah tells us that thy Lord hath decreed that you worship none but him and that you be kind to parents, whether one or both of them attain old age in life. Say not there in word of contempt, nor repel them, but address them in terms of honor and out of kindness, lower to them the wing of humility and say, my Lord, bestow on them thy mercy, even as they cherished me in childhood. So this is a, a perfect example in the Quran of how we should be um, taking in old age and as they perhaps experience the symptoms of dementia. And it's our responsibility um, as the children to be taking care of them. And there's a number of ways in which we can do this, in which uh, we can support um, dementia. So, um, like I said, we know that they have problems with memory. So uh, if they need to remember something, we can be there to be their memory, to remind them of things. They can be forgetful. It might be that they've left um, uh, when they're doing cooking or something. Um, they've left a knife out or something. So we can be responsible for keeping the environment that they live in safe. So ensuring that everything around them is safe, that, uh, that there's less chance of them having some kind of accident within the home. Like I said, another, one of the symptoms is that they fail to recognize the seasons and the weather. So helping them to select appropriate clothing so they're not going out in something light when it's cold outside or the other way around if it's hot outside, making sure um, that they're wearing something light. To do as well is to encourage them to tell stories, to use their imagination, to use their brain. And likewise, reading to them as well can help to uh, stimulate the imagination as well. So this is another useful thing um, that carers um, can do as well. Also ensuring that they are eating and drinking properly, especially as they head towards the later stages of dementia. Um, when they don't recognize that they're thirsty, for example, so keep an eye on ensuring that they are eating and drinking properly because they might not realize whether they are or not. Time, we, we don't, we're not just supporting the person with dementia, but we need to support the person who is caring for the person with dementia as well. Because the person who is caring for them will also need additional support too. And often, carers can be forgotten about because all the focus is on caring for the person who needs uh, caring for. So it's important that we also support people who are caring situation. And there can be a number of ways in which we can support carers as well. Um, we can give them physical support. Maybe it's that they need some kind of uh, respite care. Maybe we should go in um, and assist with taking care of the person with dementia so that they can take some time out to go and relax. Also, um, know that they'll be going through some very emotional difficulties as well in watching their friend or their family member going through um, these changes. Changes as well can, uh, within the family, there'll be a change in family roles as the person has a cognitive decline. Um, taking it in turns to look after the person can be um, a real emotional challenge, so there'll be need for emotional support as, as well. And also um, financially as well, it can be very um, expensive because it might be that um, people need to um, take a step back from work in order to stay at home and take care of the person with dementia as well. And obviously this can have financial implications for the family as well. So supporting them financially as well can be a, a big support as well. Important as well for um, the carer to be well educated about dementia and what to expect and how to manage it, maybe how to manage the behavioral symptoms, what to expect in the future. 
that they are educated as well. And this could be through some kind of um, education program or um, just supporting them in, in learning about the condition. In order for the carer to um, cope with the situation, it's important that they have these really um, strong support networks. And that, that's where, you know, if you're not looking after somebody with dementia yourself, it might be that you know somebody who is and providing support for them because having that kind of support can really um, make things a lot easier. So just to know anyway, generally that about the person who actually has Alzheimer's or who actually has dementia, we also need to think about the people who are caring for them as well because they are also a um, heavy burden as well. So we need to support them as much as we do the people with dementia and Alzheimer's as well. And just to finish off on, um, where is research right now? So everything is very current. In fact, 90% um, of what we actually know about Alzheimer's disease now has only been discovered in the last 15 years. So it's something that's very current at the moment. There's a lot of research um, going on specifically into um, how Alzheimer's affects the brain. So um, it's a very popular area of research and inshallah things will continue to, ve to develop and uh, we'll be able to work maybe on preventative measures or better ways of managing it once it's been diagnosed. But it's a very well researched area presently. Interesting that um, I also, we've also seen um, in the media um, uh, fairly recently actually is that um, research has shown that fasting twice a week serves as a protective measure in developing um, dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, and this was conducted, this was not a piece of research that was conducted by Muslims, but I just think this is it's great that the research is supporting what we already know in Islam. To us that we do fast twice a week on uh, Mondays and Thursdays as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did. And in fact, it turns out that this is, um, scientists and uh, researchers have found this to be um, a very good way of preventing things like dementia and Alzheimer's. So. Um, this is a current piece of research that we can draw upon um, and combine with our knowledge in Islam. So Jazakum Allah for listening. That's the end of my presentation now and I'm um, happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Jazakum khair, Sister Hannah. Anyway, we'll now take a few questions. So please type your questions in the chat box. Please make sure that the question is brief and related to the topic so we can make, we can maximize the benefit. From the session inshallah as for the question does it attack to the people facing ocd yes. um i don't know that there's been any research to link the two conditions together um they're kind of typically listed as two separate uh, two separate conditions um with no link between the two say necessarily that anyone with OCD is a, at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's and there certainly doesn't seem to be any risk uh, or research that um, suggests any increased risk for people with OCD. I request all the attendees to please type the questions soon so we could take them. How can we help students who face short-term memory? Of problems with short-term memory? Who face the problem with short memory, yes. Okay. Um, well, I suppose um, engaging in cognitive, uh, some kind of cognitive training, practicing. Um, you can even get books or even online, let's say. Um, you can do kind of what you call these brain training exercises. So just um, keep exercising your memory all the time. Also, writing things down as well. I I also have problems with uh, poor short-term memory, and I find that um, writing things down always helps. I've always got to-do lists on the go. Um, the I'm putting it in places where you can see. <laughs> Please go on. I'm so sorry. That's yeah. No, that that's a, a for me who has a problem with short term memory as well. <laughs> I find that to be a technique that seems to work well. I'm write, always writing things down that I need to do and putting it somewhere where I can see. Put it up on the fridge. Um, 
Yes, um, I, I have, to do this I have well. a friend who always puts the post-its everywhere just to remember yes. everything. My phone as well, that's another good thing as well. If I have an appointment uh, that I need to remember, I've always got an alarm going. Medication, if I have medication to take, I have an alarm on my phone. <laughs> so, problems with this. Next, we have a question from a sister, Amanita. Uh, I'm, I'm probably with listening for a long period of time. I'm just 26. She's saying that she has problems with listening for really long for a long period of time. Okay. And she's just 26. Okay. I would say um, taking notes. If it's um, if it's um, attending lectures and um, kind of taking in a lot of information over maybe you've got a lecture for an hour or something. Um, if it's something that you have to attend that you attend live, then I would say be taking notes as you go along. Um, if it's something that you can, uh, if it's something maybe that you're watching on the internet or something that you can uh, pause, maybe um, watch it in sections of 10 minutes, take a break, come back for another 10 minutes, take a break, so that you're not trying to process a, an entire hour worth of content. Next, we have a question uh, from Sister Uzma. She's asking, how can we help the child age five years? I think this is with respect to them remembering things. Okay. As in, how can you help them grasp more? Maybe the activities you can do with the child that helps them retain information much longer than normal? Um, what I would say with, with a child that's age five is probably they can, um, there are various activities that they could do the same as for adults uh, to exercise their brains and their memory. But I think at the age of five, there should it should actually perhaps be more on the parents to not expect too much from them. At the age of five, we shouldn't be necessarily expecting that they can um, memorize a lot in a short space of time. And it's for us as parents to be patient with the child more than um, trying to. Sometimes I find that if you force a child to learn more than what they are capable of doing, it only makes things worse. So I think for the for the parents of the of a five year old. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter myself, so I'm quite familiar with the struggles of um, struggles of trying to help them remember. And I think what I've come to learn from my experience with my older children is that it's about just giving them the, the time, giving them time to do it in their own, being patient with them to learn something in their own time. And children are different as well. I've noticed that some children will learn very quick and some will just naturally take longer than others. But that's for that's for us to be patient with. Next question we have is from a brother. Uh, he asks that uh, my grandfather is suffering from Parkinson, and as you described the stages of Alzheimer's, uh, so as per these stages, he's in seventh stage. I just want your good self to advise about what diet should I plan for him, and exercise as well. But he's not uh, he's not strong enough to stand up okay may Allah grant you ease and may Allah grant him ease as well um, it must be quite a difficult time right now um, for you but um, as the carer obviously you'll be uh, if he's in the seventh stage now um, if we're to refer to the stages that we were going through there then um, the responsibility is obviously very much on um, you as a family so obviously to follow a, a healthy diet as um, we all should, including all the different um, nutrients and um, be your responsibility to make sure that he is um, getting this um, healthy diet. Um, and as for the exercise, okay, if he's not strong enough to stand up, then that can be quite difficult. But there are um, certain exercises that you can do um, sitting down. You can get these, um, Kind of like a maybe like a sitting down bicycle, so you don't actually have to stand up. You can do it from um, by sitting down. Um. Okay, and shall we move to the next question? It's by Sister Salva. Uh, she asks, "How are Parkinson and dementia related?" Okay, well, um, dementia refers more to the um, the cognitive and the behavioural um, differences, whereas Parkinson's is more of a physical thing um 
changes in the brain, but one affecting more of the physical side, one affecting more of the mental side. Um, like I mentioned, there is a specific type of dementia that kind of um, overlap between the two. So an overlap between the two does exist in a diagnosis, but typically the Parkinson's would be something more of a physical condition, whereas dementia would be the cognitive kind of decline. Jazakallah khair, Sister Hannah. Why, yeah. We thank you on the behalf on behalf of the IU and the audience for your amazing presentation. May Allah reward you for it. Um, With this, we come to an end to the second day of Solace 2016, the day which was filled with sessions that cater to our day-to-day -day life. Alhamdulillah. We would like to thank all the attendees for joining us today and we hope to see you all tomorrow as well, inshallah. Please do remember to join us tomorrow sharp at 3.45 p.m. Qatar time. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes these sessions truly beneficial for all of us and relieves us of the trials we may be facing. Ameen. Till we meet next, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.